In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at this, one of the rarest Beatles box sets out there, the 1982 Beatles Mono Collection. Hi, I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions. In this analysis, I'll not only be looking at the history and contents of this ultra rare set, but I'll also be going into detail about the cuttings used for each album and how the sound quality stacks up against the mighty 2014 box. I spent most of my Saturday mornings back in 1982 hanging around Cambridge, mostly at a great oldest shop called The Beat Goes On. It was a magical place for a 15 year old record collector with an Aladdin's cave basement packed full of 50s and 60s records and walls lined with exotic and rare picture sleeves. This was the place where I started buying original Beatles albums and the first one I bought there was this actual mono white album for which I paid the princely sum of £9.99. It was also the shop in which author Nick Hornby spent a lot of his time and is thought to have been the inspiration for Championship Vinyl the shop at the heart of his book High Fidelity. The ground floor of the shop was stocked with new records, mostly New Wave and the type you just couldn't find in Woolworths. And it was there, high up on the wall, that I vividly recall seeing this big candy apple red box. But to my disappointment, it was way beyond my pocket. So I consoled myself instead with a mono reissue of Yellow Submarine. So what exactly was this unobtainable red box? And what's the story behind it? Well, let's find out. By the end of 1969, mono was a dead format in the UK. The last Beatles albums to be pressed in mono were Please Please Me, Help, and Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. They were the only three titles which had made the transition onto EMI's new one box label design in October of that year. Once that single small batch was sold, that seemed to be that for the Beatles in mono. Fast forward to spring 1981, and driven by the tragic events of the previous December, coupled with a growing nostalgia for the 60s in general, EMI saw a significant increase in interest and demand for Beatles product. With Apple still in disarray, EMI were free to do pretty much what it wanted with the existing Beatles catalogue. However, restricted by being unable to use any unreleased material, they had by the end of 1980, almost run out of ideas. However, a suggestion that the mono albums might be due for a revival led to one of EMI's more inspiring decisions of that time. A mono box set would be the ideal companion to the BC13 stereo LP box, which at that time was still selling well. The first job on the road to the mono set was to retrieve all the original surviving mono stampers from EMI's meticulously kept stamper library and decide what, if anything, needed recutting. Unfortunately, some of the original metalwork had either been damaged over the years or just was no longer serviceable. So engineer Harry Moss, who had cut the original albums back in the 60s, went about recutting as he thought necessary. By early summer 1981, EMI had pressed up all 10 Beatles studio albums in mono. The exact number pressed isn't known, but it was unlikely to have been more than 10,000 units per title. These were then distributed not only in the UK, but also to the US, Germany and Australia, where they went on sale as individual albums on the 27th of July, 1981. The red box set containing all 10 mono albums was given the catalogue number BMC10 and was released in October, 1982. The US didn't initially get the red box, but was treated to 1,000 individually numbered black box sets, which carried the catalogue number BM1. Although there's some conjecture about the actual number of the black boxes, I'm going to say there were just 1,000 units produced. I looked at a lot of past sales of these sets online, and while many of those listings are short on pressing details, all state their limited edition number, and none I saw were numbered higher than 1,000. 
However, if you have a number higher than that, drop me a line in the comments. Such was the demand in the US that some red box sets were later imported from the UK and they retailed new for around $90 per set. As the red boxes weren't numbered, it's more difficult to say exactly how many were made, but I'll say it was the same as the black box. So let's now turn our attention to this particular red set I've got with me here. By the time this box set reached the shops, most of the albums in it had been recut due mainly to the original stampers wearing out. So as a general rule, the albums contained in box sets contain more recuts than the individually released albums which were pressed first. As you can see, most of the inner sleeves in this set are dated and tell us that the majority of these pressings came from between June and November 1981, although the Sgt Pepper inner appears to be from September 1982. Compared with the deluxe covers on the 2014 set, the album covers in here are, like the blue stereo box, rather cheap looking, but the image definition is excellent. The discs labels are designed to look like the 60s issues, with the main difference being the addition of a small mono indicator. Although not as heavy as the 200 gram discs of the 2014 set, the discs in this set weigh an average of 120 grams, and all are excellent pressings. The weight of a disc is, after all, no guarantee of good sound quality. At the time of this set's release, vinyl production was probably at its zenith, not just in terms of sales, but also production. The EMI factory was by now operating around the clock seven days a week and could churn out 120,000 high quality units a day. This high standard of production was a process they'd been perfecting for 30 years since they began pressing vinyl LPs in 1952. That experience and quality is really in evidence in this set. Compare that with the 2012 and 2014 sets where getting a clean, flat disc was much more of a lottery. So now let's take a closer look at each album in this set and in particular if the cuttings were original 60s tube cuttings or 1981 solid state cuts. By tube cutting, I mean that the records were cut on equipment which used vacuum tubes or valves to amplify the signal, whereas solid state gear uses electronic transistors to provide amplification. One way to tell the recuts from the originals is to look for Harry Moss's initials HTM in the runout. It wasn't until the early 1970s that it became the fashion for cutting engineers to sign their work like this. So generally speaking, cuttings with his initials on are post-1970. I've also recorded one track from each album on the computer so we can look at the waveform and compare it directly against the 2014 disc. As I mentioned in my video on the 2014 set, the cuttings on those discs were, due to the increased sensitivity of modern cutting heads, cut much quieter than the originals. So in order to focus on the difference in dynamics rather than the difference in volume levels, I've normalized each waveform to zero dB. So let's start at the beginning with Please Please Me. The Dash 1 Sidewind cutting had been employed throughout the album's original mono run, but it needed a recut for this set and that turned out to be Dash 3. Side 2, however, retains its 1965-2N tube cutting. For this first comparison, I've taken the new solid state cut on side 1 to compare with the 2014, and the waveform you can see here is I saw her standing there. They do, on the face of it, look very similar. However, the 1981 cut is a little fuller and louder and has more transient peaks, which I think makes it sound warmer and more dynamic than the 2014. Early pressings of With The Beatles used the original Dash 7 end tube cutting from November 1963 on both sides. However, this became damaged early on in production, so on the 27th of October 1981, Harry had to recut the entire album, resulting in this Dash 8 solid state cut. This is all my loving from that album, and as you can see, it's pretty much the opposite of the Please Please Me comparison. Here, it's the 2014 cut which appears the more dynamic of the two, and certainly sounds it. The 1981-8 sounds lifeless and overcompressed by comparison, so I'm awarding this round to the 2014. Remarkably, A Hard Day's Night kept its original 3N3N tube cutting from June 1964 all throughout the 1981 run. 
However, the album's transfer sheet shows that a Dash 4 cutting of side 1 was made on the 27th of October 1981, but was never used. This is If I Fell, and to be honest, there's virtually nothing to choose between the two. Both the 1981 and 2014 are fantastic dynamic cuts, so it's definitely on as even here. Beatles for Sale was originally released in 1964 with a mixture of 3N and 4N cuttings. And initial copies of the 1981 pressing came with various combinations of those tube cuts. The LP in this set, however, has a Dash 5 solid state cut on side 1, done by Harry once again on the 27th of October 1981. The tube cut 3N on side 2 remained unchanged throughout this pressing. Here's the album's opener, No Reply, from the Dash 5 recut, and, like If I Fell, there's very little to choose between the two here. There's one or two more dynamic peaks on the 1981 cut, but it's really too close to call. Initial 1981 pressings of Help came, like the 1965 pressing, with Dash 2 cuttings on both sides. The original Side 2 tube cut survived on all 1981 pressings, but Side 1 was recut as Dash 3 midway through production on June the 1st. This comparison of You've Got to Hide Your Love Away is interesting. Although the dynamics are very similar, there's something going on in the high frequencies. Let's take away the waveform and look more closely at the spectrograph, specifically at those dots in the upper 10k range. Those are the tambourine beats in the song, and in the 1981 cut, they extend right to the chart's upper edge. But in the chart below, they fall quite a way short, pointing to the use of some noise reduction on the 2014 disc. The Dash 5 Dash 5 cutting rubber sole is a masterpiece, and to my ears, the best sounding mono cutting of the entire Beatles catalogue. It was cut on the 28th of January 1966, not by Harry Moss, but by his colleague, EMI's legendary classical music cutting engineer, Hazel Yarwood. Early copies of the 1981 pressing contained Dash 5 on both sides, but for some reason it needed recutting. So this time it was down to Harry to make the Dash 6, which is included in this set. You're now looking at the waveform of The Word, and the 1981 cut, like the majority in this set, is mixed a touch louder than the 2014. But in most areas, the 2014 is a shade more dynamic. But again, I'm really splitting hairs, and they both are terrific sounding discs. Again, as with the Blue Box, the decision was made to omit a collection of Beatles oldies. And that's a shame, because although it's not a great sounding album, it is important because it includes all the original 45 hit mixes of the singles. The 2014 box made up for that with the inclusion of the Mono Masters, but customers who bought this set in 1981 got no bonus content whatsoever. Maybe EMI thought just having them in mono was good enough for the collectors. We all know about the first pressing of Revolver, which was initially Dash 2 Dash 1, with side 2 quickly becoming Dash 2 and Dash 3 within the space of a few days in July 1966. Some early copies of this pressing retained that Dash 2, Dash 3 coupling, but most, like this one, have solid state Dash 3 and Dash 4 recuts. This is the opening track, Taxman, and again, they're both very close, but the 1981 has a little more punch than the 2014, which is quite soft by comparison so my vote in this round goes to the 1981 disc. The original 1967 mono cutting of Sgt Pepper is rightly regarded as the best sounding version of this album, and Harry Moss, who had cut the original, agreed and saw no need for a recut of either side in 1981. However, a mix up at the pressing plant later on in production resulted in side two being mispressed in stereo, just as it is on the copy in this set. We don't know how many were mispressed, but it seems that this error only occurred on later or box set pressings. Here's a comparison of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, and again the 2014 sounds a little soft next to the original. However, both are nice and detailed with great dynamics, but unsurprisingly it's the legendary Dash 1 original which wins this bout. Early 1968 pressings of the White Album were all blessed with Dash 1 cuttings on all sides and early copies of this pressing retained the Dash 1 on sides 1 and 2. There were some transitional copies, 
but most ended up as dash two, dash two, dash four, dash two, all of which were original tube cuttings. Now dash four does look like it should be a 1982 recut, but I've had original 1968 mono pressings with this cutting on side three. So I know for certain that this pressing is 100% tube cut. The original mono pressing of this album always had its issues, mainly due to the large amount of information on each side. The 2014 technology coped much better with this. And like the majority of the album, this track Martha My Dear sounds fuller and more dynamic than the original tube cutting. The Mono Yellow Submarine was basically a fold down of the stereo pressing. The 1969 originals were dash one dash one, as were early copies of the 1981 pressing. However, side two was quickly recut, giving us the dash two on this and the majority of copies. Some of the 1981 discs were mispressed with stereo labels instead. The full mono album was not included in the 2014 set, but vintage 1968 mono mixes of the album's four original songs made up side five of the Mono Masters LP. This is my favorite Hey Bulldog, and although the 2014 is a true dedicated mono mix, it's the dash one fold down, which I think rocks fuller and louder. The bass line, which is at the heart of this track for me, is much cleaner and clearer in the fold down and gets rather lost in the mix on the 2014. Maybe I just got used to it over the years, but I prefer the fold down. Overall then, it's a great sounding set. Although I wish Harry Moss had recut everything again in 1981, but I suppose that was time and money EMI didn't want to spend. As I mentioned before, the discs in the red box were generally not the earliest pressings from this run. So unless you're very lucky and find a box set for sale at a reasonable price, I'd recommend searching out individual copies of these pressings. Either way, you won't be disappointed. Please keep your suggestions for future videos coming in, and I'd really appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe before you go. I'll be back with more soon, but I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.